Shellfish is one of the most eaten delicacies in Hong Kong. As the population grows, the demand for shellfish has expanded like never before. Due to a lack of awareness of paralytic shellfish poisoning from the general public, effective food safety has suddenly approached us. We wanted to solve a local problem just like any other iGEM team, so of course, we tried to research deeper into our home city, Hong Kong. Did you know that Hong Kong is a subtropical archipelago consisting of 236 islands? Surrounded by the South China Sea, it wouldn't be hard to see why seafood is an integral part of our diet. Per capita speaking, Hong Kong ranks second in terms of seafood consumption in Hong Kong. Each of us consumes 66.5 kg of seafood on average every year, which is more than three times the global average. And in 2019 alone, the estimated production was about 123,000 tons valued at $2.8 billion. As you can see, Hong Kong people love to eat seafood. Focusing on only one of these seafoods, shellfish is not only eaten in Hong Kong, but harvested as well. It is seen as gold here. However, not all that glitters is gold. Shellfish in particular can often hold an unpleasant visitor behind their sweet taste. As shellfish is a colloquial term for many types of marine animals, here we we'll define shellfish as bivalve mollusks, most of which are filter feeders. As they consume little planktons, they also take up organisms that can produce life-threatening toxins. Not for the shellfish itself, but for the animals that consume it. Many shellfish can accumulate toxins as waste or even as a defense mechanism for up to two years. There are different types of shellfish toxins, as paralytic shellfish toxins, or PST for short, are the most common yet the most deadly, we decided that we would focus on this specific toxin for our project. Paralytic shellfish toxins, such as saxotoxin and tetrodotoxin, are neurotoxins that cause paralytic shellfish poisoning by blocking the sodium channels in nerve cell membranes. Symptoms of PSP range from diarrhea all the way to flaccid paralysis, respiratory failure, and even death. They are also heat-stable, meaning that they will still be in the shellfish even after cooking. These toxins can be found in both marine and freshwater environments as they are naturally produced by certain species of marine dinoflagellites and freshwater cyanobacteria. Wild shellfish that grow during harmful algae blooms accumulate these toxins. With increasing seafood demand, there is an increased risk of paralytic shellfish poisoning after consuming contaminated bivalves. Due to climate change and the warming of freshwater and saltwater environments, the frequency of harmful algae blooms is increasing and worryingly also in regions where there were no algal blooms before. Haps are also increasing from pollution. As you can see on the map, PSP is focused around the Pacific Ocean and is very prevalent around Asia. This reinforced our resolve to focus on PSP as it is truly a local problem. Here you can see that the global distribution of PSP toxins significantly increased in the past 50 years. The fatality rate of PSP is very high, usually ranging from 15 to 50 percent, and affects young children and people in places with poor access to healthcare the most. The Center for Health Protection recorded 68 suspected shellfish toxin-related food poisoning by 2011, and is despite regular testing of shellfish that is consumed by humans. Many cases of PSP also go unreported, as many assume that it is a regular digestive issue or that they are eating something dirty. This issue is quite scary as there are currently no antidotes for paralytic shellfish poisoning, so the best thing we can do is to prevent it. So, what are the current solutions? The government facility for food safety in Hong Kong states, currently, there are no known methods available for detoxifying lime-contaminated shellfish in a way that is safe, fast, and economically feasible, nor reliable quick tests to determine the presence in shellfish flesh. This reveals that there is some market gap that needs to be resolved. The two major accepted methods to test for PSC are the mouse poison bioassay and the high-performance liquid chromatography, or HPLC in short. Mouse poison bioassay, earlier accepted as the gold standard for toxin testing, can still be seen in low-budget detection centers. In this method, mice are injected with shellfish samples, and if the majority die, the whole stock of shellfish is rejected. Despite the relative ease and directness of this assay, it is non-specific, non-reproducible, unregulated, and needless to say, extremely unethical. The other solution is HPLC. Now this is a chemical way of testing for PSE. It is ethical and highly sensitive, but the cost of the high-end analytical equipment, lengthy procedures, and the need for qualified personnel hinders their acceptance in routine monitoring laboratories, especially those in developing countries. Moreover, a biological assay is a rather preferred method for testing since it can illustrate the direct response of an organism to the food it ingests. So that got us thinking. 
We wanted our solution to have the best of both worlds by being ethical, easy to operate, sustainable, and a versatile bioassay. To create something that resolves the market gap, we visited and interviewed various stakeholders from oyster farms, government officials, to molecular biochemists and testing labs to seek advice from every member of the production chain in our community. We came up with Shelby, a prokaryotic biosensor for the detection of paralytic shellfish toxins. Distributed as a kit with a set of protocols, the biosensor would glow red in the presence of toxins and glow green in the absence. But testing of shellfish toxins in a prokaryotic system is not easy. Channel blocking PSDs such as saxodoxin don't quite cause a robust response in bacteria as they do in humans. To develop a biosensor, we needed to find a way to induce significant changes within a cell upon exposure to PSD so we could generate a signal out of it. With reference to research by Fomati et al., we figured that this can be possible if we antagonize our target shellfish toxin with another channel activating drug, Veratrodin. When a cell is supplied with only Veratrodin without any channel blocking toxin, the cell undergoes a massive ion influx leading to a high osmolarity within the cell. But in the presence of channel blocking PSD, veratrodin cannot cause the influx. In fact, the ionic concentration in the cell starts to decline. We needed a mechanism to pick up this intracellular ionic chain and generate a signal out of this. The two-component system in E. coli does just that. An attractive tool for synthetic biologists, this is a signaling mechanism in prokaryotes that modulates gene expression according to osmolarity changes. The two components are EMVZ and OMPR. EMVZ is a sensory kinase which upon sensing osmotic changes phosphorylates the response regulator OMPR. Phosphorylated OMPR then can activate either of the two downstream promoters. When osmolarity is high, OMPC promoter will be activated. But when osmolarity is low, the OMPF promoter is activated. We exploit this system and regulate green fluorescence protein under OMPC promoter while a red fluorescence protein under the OMPF promoter. Conceptually, in the absence of PSD, veratrodin will cause an ion influx into the cell, activating the OMPC promoter and giving a green fluorescence readout. On the other hand, in the presence of PSD, ions in the cell will start to decline, rendering the OMPF promoter activity and a red color fluorescence will be visible. Hong Kong customs, however, do not permit the use of these toxins, so we needed ways to mimic the toxins' presence to test our circuits. We did this by culturing cells in LB media with a varying range of NACL concentration. We observed an exponential relationship between an increasing extracellular medium concentration and intracellular osmolarity in E. coli cells. Drawing from this relationship, in our experiment, a lower concentration medium mimics the presence of toxins, while higher concentration mimics the absence of toxins. After cloning the reporter construct in, we cultured cells in different osmolarity media and measured the fluorescence intensity of both red and green reporters. From low to high osmolarity, we observed the required trend. Green color is higher at high concentration and red color is higher at low concentrations. In our efforts to mathematically model the response of the circuit, we developed a new way to model the OMPC and OMPF promoters. To discuss our project, we met Dr. Avon Lee from the Ocean University of China, an expert on shellfish toxins and algal blooms. Although impressed with the idea, he seemed skeptical about the robustness of this biosensor. He raised concern over the false positive and false negative from a biosensor based on dual promoter systems. As characterized by previous teams, we are also aware of leaky expression of the promoters that we are using. This, along with our own experiment results, convinced us to modify our circuit a little. We added an anti-sense RNA to suppress background noise from the circuit. When red color is to be seen, the antisense RNA to green fluorophore will be expressed, suppressing any green color, and vice versa. After testing the efficiency of antisense molecule, we are certain that this mechanism could be beneficial in limiting false results in the biosensor. 
We can see a simulation via dry lab modeling of how antisense RNA could have minimized the overlapping of the two colors, reducing mixed expression of the two fluorophores. Now that our biosensor was taken form, we reached out to our target audience, oyster farms and testing laboratories. We visited Hong Kong's largest oyster farm, Chen Chen Chi, and learned about their ways of harvesting and distributing. Surprisingly, neither were they aware of such toxins, nor are there any regulations in place regarding its monitoring. So we saw this as an opportunity to educate them about PSTs and conventional ways to deal with it. They believe that a technology like that could not only allow a safer product into the market, but also enhance their business as tested shellfish could be sold for a higher price. But the biggest concern was the cost and the speed of the biosensor. To meet this requirement, we decided to incorporate a scaffold mechanism. Inspired from Retica et al. 2012, the scaffold is a chimera protein containing SX3 and leucine simple peptide, while the two components of the two component system have the relevant adapters. This could not only speed up but also amplify the signal from the biosensor. In order to better establish control over the circuit, we also included an auto inhibition of the kinase in order to stabilize the positive signal by creating a third hindrance in its kinase domain so no downstream signaling could happen. And finally, to create a feedback loop, we put the scaffold under the OMPC promoter, which itself is triggered by the scaffold, so it forms a positive feedback loop. We predict a switch light response where feedback mechanism causes a dramatic surge of green signal once the osmolarity passes a certain threshold. We have been engineering E. coli in order to test the genetic interaction but we had our doubts on the final chassis for our biosensor. We needed to ensure that the antagonizing toxins that make the biosensor work can actually bind to the channels of E. coli. After multiple attempts through bioinformatics and enormous help from Dr. Brad Newland from Australia, it was the molecular docking analysis that helped us establish that E. coli was indeed the most suitable chassis for our project. We found a major osmoregulatory porin, MSCS, to have binding efficiency to the toxin that is similar to human neurons. The final circuit, although genetically complex, ensures robustness, versatility, speed, and accuracy to the final user. We contacted Dr. Mark Van Aston, the managing director of diagnostic technologies, to pitch our prototype and gather essential feedback for implementation. His field liaison and expertise helped shape our final deliverable. We eventually present Shelby as a kit containing the genetically engineered cells and easy to handle durable irradiation. In order to make the product safer to use, we could replace the antagonist drug, Verbrushidin, with a simple osmolite like glycine. However, we would need to test if this would impact the sensitivity of the biosensor towards the shellfish toxin. As we sought out to resolve the market need for a feasible shellfish testing device, we took a survey aimed towards Hong Kong locals on shellfish consumption and their awareness towards shellfish toxin. We received over 150 responses and we learned that despite the high demand of shellfish, most people were not aware of shellfish toxin poisoning, and even harmful elbow boots. Our approach for education is three-pronged, with our main targets being the farmers, the students, and the consumers, or the general public. To target the shellfish farmers, we visited shellfish farms and held talks with stakeholders in the food and testing industry in order to promote our project idea. We hope that doing this can stir awareness and a public urge to demand for change in terms of current shellfish testing methods or the lack thereof. For the students, we hosted live seminars in multiple high schools to educate students on untested shellfish as well as how synthetic biology shapes a promising future. In addition to this, we also created an educational booklet about food safety for young readers titled Magic Mr. Clam with Chinese and Cantonese translations provided by the HKU iGen team. 
And to reach even more people, we set up booths on campus, attracting a wide range of people, and uploaded informative videos online to reach a wider audience. As we think paralytic selfish toxins are a global issue, through the education of the public, we want them to be aware of the dangers of eating untested raw shellfish. However, after we tried reaching out to the general public, we realized that Hong Kong lacked a platform for sharing ideas in synthetic biology. As such, we decided to fill that gap by hosting the Hong Kong iGEM Symposium this year, where the current iGEM team can not only share their project ideas, but also their resources with other teams. This gathering was an amazing collaboration between eight local iGEM teams. We took this opportunity to also educate the Hong Kong public about the fascinating project ideas this year, hoping to demystify synthetic biology by uploading the presentation and recording online. Currently, only testing labs have access to PSD detection. Through collaborations and interviews, we got to talk to people in different parts of the shellfish industry in Hong Kong and aim to make our detection kit available to them all. We also want our project to help places that do not currently do testing for shellfish. Many developing countries do not have their shellfish tested for toxins. And although they are not exporting the shellfish, consuming the shellfish would risk them getting poisoned. Shellfish poisoning is more than just a local problem. And with climate change, it is only growing. With Shelby, we offer you a revolutionary detection system that is ethical, sustainable, and can shield you from the dangerous paralytic shellfish toxin.